Let's get the people what they want. Let's open the divisional round weekend six pack presented by our friends at the Athletic Brewing Company. All right, Stuck, you have a 55 54 lead, uh, which you warned me about betting on Cliff, and that uh, that was over rather quickly. So I got some I got some work to do here to start it off with my first overall pick. Of the divisional round weekend six pack, I am going with the Buffalo Bills plus one and a half at the Kansas City Chiefs. And Circle the wagon. <laughs> I, you know, I like this Bills team. Uh, you know, I like what they're doing. Obviously, we saw them just destroy and play almost the football equivalent of a perfect game on offense going against uh, the New England Patriots. And that's, you know, I know the Patriots look bad and they were probably would have overrated, but that's still not an easy thing to do. Uh, to a Belichick defense. So a lot of credit goes to them. But uh, I, I think this, you know, there's a reason that this line isn't going to get to three, you know, despite the Chiefs being at home, coming off a game where they won by, you know, 20 um, in Arrowhead. Uh, and that's because I think this Bills team is the real deal. Now they do a couple of things um, well uh, on both sides of the ball that I think can give them the win here for the second time uh, this year in Arrowhead. And the first thing is they can get pressure and they don't really have to blitz a ton. They're their number one in pressure rate, but more importantly, I have a metric where I subtract blitz rate from pressure rate. And that gives me a proxy for how good a team's four man rushes, you know, because ideally, especially in these playoff games against these elite quarterbacks, you really don't want to have to bring extra guys, uh, you know, to get pressure. It's not that you don't want to bring them at all. You obviously want to dial some things up, throw, you know, throw the offense off guard, put some pressure on them, but you want to be able to dictate that at, you know, when you want to do it. So four man rush, um, the bills rank third in my metric at plus 4.8% uh, because they only blitz 26% of the time to get that 30.8 pressure rate. So that's crucial against Mahomes. We know he's going to tear up the blitz. You need, seven guys in coverage because then you can really start to bracket double whatever you want to call it hill and kelsey and then that's when mahomes gets antsy that's when he starts overthinking things that's when he's gonna you know it's like how many times am i gonna have to go to byron pringle and demarcus robinson you know that's when you really start to throw the chiefs off the game maybe you get a turnover two or three uh, or four like the bills got in the first matchup and uh another thing is kansas city 8.1 8.1 yards per target against man coverage, nine versus zone. So that 8.1 versus man, that's about league average. And 9.0 against zone, that's where they really excel. But the Bills are top 10 in man coverage rate. So, you know, they can get that pressure without blitzing. They can also play man coverage uh, when they want to. And even without Tredavious White, they've been able to do it. I mean, they still have a good cornerback group. They have great safeties, as we saw on display against New England. So uh, obviously you would love to have – Love to have had White, but this is still a dangerous defense. Finished the year number one in DVOA. Um, so really like what Buffalo can do to kind of disrupt Kansas City uh, on that side of the ball. Uh, and then on the other side, you know, this we saw what this Buffalo offense can do, so I'm not going to get into all their metrics. We know they're great. Um, but this Kansas City defense is really what I think, you know, if you're betting on Kansas City here, you're putting faith in the fact that Steve Spagnuolo can kind of figure something out the second time around. And he's been great at, at kind of late the late in the year schemes. Uh, you know, I've always kind of talked about that. So a lot of respect for him, but I think this notion that this Kansas city defense is like this completely different unit than the one that was the worst in football uh, early in the year is a little bit misguided. Like since they're by, They've given up 404 yards to the Broncos. They gave up 428 to the Chargers, 475 to the Bengals, another 364 to the Broncos. They put the Raiders and Steelers. Um, you know, Raiders won Steelers twice uh, over that frame. And I just think that those two teams in general, the Chiefs just had a big edge on them coaching-wise, uh, not coaching-wise, scheme-wise, just the way they matched up. Um, but against some of these other teams, the Chiefs really haven't played well on defense. They've given up a ton of yards. Uh, and especially against these kind of playoff caliber offenses like the Chargers and Bengals put up, you know, 425 plus on on the Chiefs. So I think the defense is still going to struggle here. And in the first matchup, Buffalo outgained the Chiefs 436 to 392. Uh, now, Kansas City did have the four turnovers. Buffalo had none. But you look at Kansas City uh, and how they're going to move the ball in this game. 
uh, on offense compared to what you think their defense is going to give up. And I just think it's a bit troubling because Josh Allen in that game, 12.1 yards per attempt, 21 yards per completion in the first matchup. So like, there's a lot for Spagnola to correct here. Uh, and then meanwhile, on the other side, you know, the, the final yardage differential wasn't that crazy, but Patrick Mahomes, 5.0 yards per attempt, 8.2 yards per completion. And that kind of goes into what I said Buffalo can do well. So, uh, you know, this is not going to be an easy matchup by any means for Kansas City uh, on either side of the ball. I would I would say they're outmatched on both sides of the ball. Uh, and then you look at the, the Kansas City Chiefs and, you know, they've been great. Um, they they kind of righted the ship after that slow start. But Kansas City versus the other final four teams. So the other three teams that made the final four in the AFC. Cincinnati, Buffalo, and the Tennessee Titans. The Chiefs, 0-3, outscored 99-54, to outgained 1280-1140. to I am not sure that the Chiefs are a better team uh, in this matchup. Give me the Bills. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting there. I have a, a bunch of futures tickets, my only futures from the beginning, the Bills. So I will be rooting hard for the bills i love them in the teaser piece i would have hammered them at plus three i was all over them plus three in the first uh were they plus three i think they were plus yeah three. i think it, I think um, it closed at plus three uh in the first matchup earlier this season um i lean that way i have the bills powered right now as the best team in the nfl um now i i i will make my i mean this is a team last year they lost to the chiefs and they basically spent all of off season crafting their team and adjusting what they want to do for the chiefs. That's all they think about and all they've done. And they went, and you saw the defensive game plan and, you know, the defensive line improvements and their ability to get pressure this year. You saw that translate in the first meeting uh, when they played the chiefs. I mean, Mahomes went from, I think like eight and a half yards per attempt and no interceptions in the playoffs last year to five and a half. Uh, 4.9 yards per attempt and two interceptions. So you saw the the improvement. I think that the Bills ultimately win this game. It's going to be close. Um, but I think that both offenses have – let me – I'll go into actually my uh, – well, I'll say this one thing. You're going to hear uh, Mahomes uh, under a field goal, which is fair, but, I mean, he's un- – a favorite under a field, a field goal or less in his career – it's he's never been a dog at home. It's happened five times. He's three and two against the spread. And, you know, the Bills beat him earlier this year. The Patriots beat him in 2019 in the playoffs. And he covered the three other games. You want to hear something really funny is, and one of them was against the Cowboys. The Chiefs were only minus two and a half against the Cowboys. We were missing a like lamb. And it's pretty funny to think about the Chiefs were only minus two and a half against the Cowboys at home in no, late November. Um, and by the way, this is the funniest one. In 2018, in October, the Chiefs were three-point favorites at home against the Jags and Blake Bortles um, and Mahomes, and they won by 17. It's pretty funny to think about. Um, obviously, a different Jags day and team. But um, Josh Allen has great stats as a road underdog um, throughout his career as well. I think this is basically just comes down to these are two – great offenses that are capable of keeping up with anyone in the NFL. But at the end of the day, the bills defense is a little better and that's yeah. ultimately what's going to be the difference, but let me, I'll break down the game from another perspective. I'll go into my first pick and the second of the divisional round weekend six pack. And I'm going with the Buffalo bills, Kansas city chiefs under 54 and a half at but MGM. Try to find the 55, wait on the 55, buy it to 55 for the for the for, for this contest. It doesn't matter. Um, but it's obviously a key number. You know, it's one of the 10 most important numbers since 2015 when the extra point was moved back. Totals land on 54 55 over five percent of the time combined. Uh, so it's a really important number since 2003. Playoff totals between 54 and 56. They've had nine of them. The under's gone eight and one. 
gone under the total by 14 points per game. The only exception was last year with the Chiefs and Bills. There was 62 points scored. Chiefs and Bills scored 58 points earlier this season. And by the way, totals at 55 or above in the regular season, unders have gone 60%. It's hard to do. Right? You have to have a lot of things go right. But here's why I like the under. It's scary. This could turn into a shootout. If one team gets really far behind, then it gets really scary. But look, if we look at last year's game, and for, number one, there's a lot of familiarity. This is the fourth time these two teams will play in the last two seasons. I don't think there's going to be any surprises here. But if you look at last year's playoff game that blew up, what happened there was the Chiefs offense dominating the Bills defense with explosive plays and just they went bonkers. Well, the Bills have really fixed their defensive issues up front. They've kind of, you know, in, they've kind of caught on to the trend of, okay, let's take away the Chiefs explosive play. We'll get pressure on Mahomes. We'll see how big of a loss the tr- Trey White is. This could show up here, but the secondary is held up without him. But the defense is now on a, di- a different stratosphere, especially when pressure, like I said, it went from 22 to 33%. And on the flip side, the Chiefs offense is, number one, not as consistent, and number two, not as explosive, right? So they're, they've are they learned how to take the, you know, take what's given to them. You know, Buffalo's going to play a lot of these two high shells. They're, they're going to have method- – they have methodical long drives now that eat up the clock. That didn't used to be the case with the Chiefs. So you could have an eight-minute touchdown drive from the Chiefs. You could have an eight-minute field goal drive. Good luck trying to hit over 55. That happens on the other. And then when they played, so, you know, you have the chiefs offense, which is not as great and not as explosive. And then you have the bills defense, which is much better earlier this season, the bills, the game went over because the bills absolutely shredded the chiefs defense. Well, the chiefs were missing, you know, Ward, they were missing Chris Jones who's probably the most important defender. And the chiefs defense at that time was the worst in the league. First eight weeks, the Chiefs ranked 30th in EPA per play and 32nd in success rate. They're basically like the Texans. If you put them on a chart, it'll be them and the Texans. But since week nine, they are seventh in EPA per play and 17th in success rate. So a little lucky on points per opportunity. Their schedule was sort of beneficial. You saw like the competent quarterbacks that they faced did put up a lot of points, but the defense is there's no arguing the defense is a lot better. They changed, they made some scheme changes. Spagnola, end of the year, they got a lot of guys back. And, you know, they had some acquisitions that have helped. And Spagnola's defenses in the playoffs always overperform. So the Chiefs defense is in a much better space here. They're also probably going to come out here. They're going to, you know, they're going to have some exotic blitzes. They're also going to try to take away the explosive deep pass and they're going to make the Bills beat them underneath and move the balls. So I think you're going to have some you know, some long drives here. And on top of all of that, both of these offenses put up 40 plus last week and they looked phenomenal. You know, after the slow start for the, for the chiefs, people forget they had like touchdowns on like five straight drives. It's hard to replicate that effort two weeks in a row in the NFL. And we've seen these offenses have just all of a sudden it's, Whoa, with the, the offense, what's, what's wrong with the offense this week? And then the next week it looks great. So if either one of these offenses has one of their clunkers, this game is going way under. So there's a lot of reasons why I like this under at 55. Um, the 55 is so key. I, if it's a 54, I would not play it. The 54 and a half, maybe, but I, I wouldn't. I would, I would buy it to minus, minus 115, 55. 55 is that important. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's the Chiefs also, you know, they saw Dable's kind of attack last week of unleashing Josh Allen in the run game. I'm assuming they're going to do that again, but they have some film some film to go off on that and uh Andy Reid at home 47 36 and one to the under and that includes five and two in games with totals of 55 or greater going under by 8.2 points per game so I think there's a, a lot more paths to the under than there are to the over I might end up looking like a fool here but I think ultimately the Bills win this game. I think it's going to be a close one. The first, the last couple haven't been. I'm going to say 27 24 Buffalo Bills. Yeah, no, it's listen, the Chiefs, like I said, they're the defense has improved. I don't think it's like a totally different unit. I still think, you know, they'll give up 
more plays than not to the Bills. But I do totally agree that the way the Bills are going to play, it's going to make the Chiefs drive down the field. And, you know, knowing Spagnuolo, he's going to try to do the same. Uh, you know, will he be successful? They weren't really in the first meeting. But uh, I do think there's quite the possibility for one of those two offenses to have to get at least long drives. Uh, and, you know, there'll probably be uh, a, at least a couple of, of red zone stops in there. So, yeah, it's just so hard to get to these high totals, cold weather, outdoor game. So, yeah, I don't disagree. For my second pick in the third overall in the divisional round six pack, I'm going with the Tennessee Titans minus three and a half against the Cincinnati Bengals. And, you know, this is one of those where it kind of goes against the trends here. You know, Titans are first round, uh, have a first round bye. They're the favorite, but I think they match up really well with this Bengal team. Uh, and I think you have to kind of throw the metrics away for the Titans. I, I know both of these teams are, I mean, from a matchup perspective, this looks like one of the worst divisional round matchups in, in ages. I mean, both of these teams are like middle of the pack in, in DVOA and it's just not pretty, but you look at this Tennessee team and for the first time all year, they may have all 22 starters healthy on offense to defense. That's big. That, that first round by was big. Uh, for them in that instance. Um, yeah, they use the most players in NFL history. 91, 91 players. And now they're for the first time all year. So like we haven't even seen this Titans team at like true full strength. Uh, we also know that, you know, Vrabel um, hasn't been great as a favorite, but we have seen him in the playoffs come up with some, him and his staff come up with some great game plans. And uh, they've especially done that on the defensive side of the ball. I think, you know, they've, they've been here now, you know, this is still the Bengals, you know, they just won their first playoff game in over three decades. Now they're going into on the road into a divisional round team. That's been doing this, you know, year in and year out, getting here, surprising people. Um, they know what it is, but beyond that uh, you look at when the Titans have had Derek Henry who practiced, you know, full, full pads, all that stuff. Um, looks like he's going to go when they've had him with AJ Brown um and julio jones on the field at the same time they average seven yards per play when all three of them are on the field at the same time for the season the titans average 5.1 yards per play now yards per play is directly correlated with points obviously the more yards you get the more points you get so you could see you know we kind of joke about julio jones and the fact that he's never on the field even when he does suit up but you know for the first time we could see like all these guys get you know 80 plus percent of the snaps here. Julio Jones played 85% of the snaps in the finale. AJ Brown was at 91. So 85% of the routes, I should say, for Julio, which is what you need. Um, so you're going to have a, a, a full go Titans team. And that's a massive, massive difference. Then you look at their offensive line, which had injuries at different parts of the year. Well, their worst offensive line now will still be in the 56th percentile in PFF grades. Taylor Luan, 37th of 84. And a lot of people, you know, look at that line and say he might be their best offensive lineman. Uh, but, you know, you have the center, Jones, he's uh, eighth. You have the right tackle, Questenberry, he's 17th of 84 tackles. Both guards are in the top 30 uh, of 80 plus guards. So this is a strong offensive line. You're going to have your three playmakers uh, on the field uh, for a good amount of the snaps where you're just averaging, I mean, but 33% more in terms of your yards per play almost. And then you look at what's Tennessee going to do in this game, you know, with Henry, if with Henry back with Julio and Brown on the outside, that puts the play action game back in a full force. Well, Cincinnati 117.7 QBR allowed against play action 27th in the NFL, second worst among playoff teams, Cincinnati 8.7 yards per play against play action 30th in the NFL worst among playoff teams so this is going to be a tough matchup for Cincinnati Hendrickson practice look like he'll play uh but still you you have a a D line that might be you know Ogan Ogan Joby went on a season ending IR so still a defensive line that may be you know not quite 100 percent obviously without Ogan Joby going against now Derrick Henry going against this play action game um just kind of getting worn down as the game went on which almost hurts them against the Raiders uh, if we're being quite honest. And then on the other side, you know, Tennessee, this is still a, a physical defense that has really good game plans. Joe Burrow only threw for 244 against the Raiders. It wasn't like he's a he's a juggernaut against these teams that like are over reliant on man coverage. Tennessee can do both. Um, and 
So you also look at Tennessee and another thing they can do, which is going to be key against this, you know, this great receiving core. They're fifth in four man rush. They have a pressure rate of 24, but their blitz rate is only 19.9 fifth lowest. So that plus 4.1 margin between their pressure rate and their blitz rate, that's fifth best in the NFL. And we know Joe Burrow kills man coverage. He kills the blitz. Tennessee doesn't have to do that at all uh, to be successful here. So I don't think Tennessee is going to get every stop. They, you know, they've struggled at times, but we also haven't seen Tennessee fully healthy. Uh, they're at home. And then here's another thing that, you know, if you're betting on Cincinnati, I know you're getting the hook at three and a half, but here's something that would worry me a little bit. And I, I talked about this last week with the Patriots, the Patriots coming in the last week, you know, they were second in DVOA on offense at home, but 23rd on the road. That's a minus 21 gap in terms of ranking the second worst gap. The Bengals, minus 16. They're ninth in DVOA at home, 25th on the road. And we saw what happened to the Patriots last week. I mean, defense was a mess, but it wasn't like the offense exactly did anything either. Um, this Bengal team that only put up 26 on the Raiders, I think you're going to need more against this healthy Titans offense, uh, and I don't think you're going to get it. So uh, like the matchup for the Titans, give me them minus three and a half. Yeah, I like to match up for the defense because like we set up with the Raiders last week. Like it's not a bl- it's not the Titans aren't gonna blitz you, like you said. They, you know, have been able to generate pressure. It, it, for me, this is just uh, Burrow is not gonna be intimidated, which is one thing. Like he's playing yeah. a lot of big games. So I think that that works in Cincy's favor. But I'm having I just haven't had trouble with this game. Like I can't get to and, and look, here's something that's that'll back you up. And, and a stat that you're going to love for your side. Mike Frabel, who's only 15, 20, and one against the spread as a favorite. Like Tennessee tends to play up and down to everybody, which is a little concerning here whenever you're laying over a field goal. But Vrabel, who might be becoming one of the most underrated coaches in the NFL, with nine or more days to prep. So it's bye weeks or after Thursday night games. It's happened eight times in his career. He's 8 0 straight up, 8 0 against the spread. Covered by an average margin of 18 points per game. The average final score in those games, 30 to 10. 4 0 against the spread as a favorite, 4 0 against the spread as a dog. But, uh, you know, I just can't get to this number. And when we say, like, when I I say, oh, the the team's off a bye, haven't covered well, I mean, like, number one, there's a lot of noise in that. The bye is obviously valuable for rest, for preparation. You know, you're playing other teams who've got injuries, who had to play. And, you know, it's a short week for, uh, you know, like all these things, they matter, but does the market overweigh them? That's the only question. Um, so I just can't get to this number, but I don't want to back Cincy. It, it just that Tennessee is a very difficult team to handicap because their sample size of what they are this year, you know, at full strength is not much. Right. And then it's like, all right, is Derek Henry going to get his full workload? Is there going to be like rust with all these new parts back? Um, so that's a possibility as well. But I think from a matchup perspective with the play action, you know, with Tennessee liking to throw over the middle of the field on play action where since he's vulnerable, I think Tennessee's defense matches up well. They played really well in the second half of the year. They go all, you know, Vrabel has been great with time to prep all you know, Titans at home. I think the Bengals are generally an overrated team. I just had the Titans rated low, but, it, you know, I, I can get to like three. I just couldn't lay it here, but I can understand anyone that wants to. Titans are just a really difficult team to handicap for me, knowing that they're at full strike now. So it's a stay away from me. I will be looking to bet it live to see based on what I'm seeing. Um, and I will have a prop, though. I'll prop action, which will take me to my – I'll save my – side for my third pick i'll go into my second pick because i'm curious to get your thoughts on this to see maybe i'm an idiot on my props again i had kittle over last week i think he had one catch um, i mean you almost killed my under in like the first quarter so yeah we that wasn't wasn't a great week for us prop betting on tight ends huh well that's on you i'm i'm allowed uh, I'm, I'm allowed <laughs> I mean, I just had the bigger um, problem was I just had no luck on like Saturday or Monday. Like I just, I, I, you know what I mean? Like Sunday was fine. It's Saturday, Monday. I mean, again, that's on you bet on cliff. That's on you. Um, <laughs> True. Uh, so yeah, for my, for my, for my second pick in the fourth overall of the divisional weekend six pack, it's my prop. We have one prop, one side, 
one total or we have one prop and then one side or total for the other two. I'm going with, hopefully he's playing and he's not scratched. Uh, no, he'll play. You're, you're going to sit here and tell me this. Like, oh he's yeah, playing. He's, no, actually, he's playing. He's absolutely know, playing. I'm kidding. Okay. Uh, Jeff Swaim, <laughs> Jeff Swaim, Geoff Swaim over 11 and a half receiving yards. He's like uh, the Walmart Travis Kelsey. He's like, when just looking at him, like he always, he look kind of looks like, he looks like, you know, that sculpture of uh, Ronaldo that's like yeah. all messed up. That's like what Jeff Swaim <laughs> is. Uh, if he was Travis Kelsey. Uh, sorry, Jeff. I love you. So I'm betting you're over prop here. Um, but um, yeah, there's, I think that this is on the season. He averaged like 13 and a half receiving yards per game. And now you have uh, Pruitt, who is out for the year with an ankle injury. So, you know, his production, I think, is going to go up, uh, especially in this matchup, right? So I think the number is low just from someone who doesn't really do projections. I was just kind of looking at his numbers. And then this is just a matchup where you want the tight ends. The Bengals are the worst team in the playoffs by far against tight ends. I think they're bottom five DVOA guarding tight ends. They give it up like 63 yards per game to tight ends, which is bottom five in the NFL. They're weak over the middle of the field. You got Brown back. You got Jones back. You got Henry back. Like, why, why are we going to Jeff Swain? Well, he's probably going to be open on play action. Um, play action, middle of the field. Also, you know, I'll, I'll throw I'll, – I'll put this in the app. I, I would have thrown a couple dollars on Jeff Swain first touchdown. He actually has – I think he's like second on the team in receiving touchdowns. He's like three touchdowns on the year. I can see him – you know, the two or three yard line, everyone sells out for Henry, and then you're gonna you're gonna hit Swain for a touchdown. Um, so I think the number is low. The matchup is good, and um, I think Swain, I think he's a Texas boy, will uh, will have a. I think he's gonna get like he averages like two catches a game. Um, so I think he'll get two catches for like 18 yards. Um, so that's what I ended up going with. You can tell me I'm dumb. I'm curious to your thoughts. Uh, Jeff Swain, because the funny thing is that's what I picked on. And then I have you in the back of my head being like, whenever you see these random tight ends, just go under the low total. And yeah. I'm like, fuck, well, I really like this over. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it, uh, I went with Swain. I was going to go with Mixon over rushing yards, but then I didn't know. Like it, I, I was so bad unsure game about the game. Could be a bad yeah, game that, script. Yeah, that's yeah. – so I was like, all right, if they – I don't have a feel for the game. So if they're down like 14 or so, it's like you're you're gonna be passing the whole game. Yeah, no, I, I actually agree. So I have I'm looking at my projections for him uh right now. I have him at uh 2.3 catches for 16 yards. So not 18, but 16. But that's you know how that's a very valuable every yard is very valuable when you're talking about a prop of 11 and a half, right? You yeah. know, it's not like yeah, and he's, he's had not, a couple games like 50 yard receptions. I think that the, yeah, the the hot the upside is really high here. And to your point, and this can take me into my next, but I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you the stat first. Uh, Cincinnati 24th in DVOA against tight ends, 12th against non number one, number two receivers. So just from kind of a schematic standpoint, you know, with, with now Jones and, and Brown and, and Henry, now you can play your two tight end sets comfortably. Like you don't need that third receiver on the field to give you a little extra in the pass game that you lacked without, you know, Julio. So uh, I think you see Tennessee kind of go, if they want, if they could, I think they would go two tight ends every snap, you know, if that, if the game plan kind of dictated it and they didn't get into third and long. So uh, I think you're going to see that. And Ferkser, that's Ferkser better not, uh, what do you, what do you fast <laughs> people call it? Uh, vulture. Or vulture. Vulture. Yeah. Better that would, well, if you go first right. touchdown, he could, he could definitely vulture. That could it. happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just um, going to be a little, little tiny but, for fun. Ferkser actually may have I Ferkser is the you know better pass catcher of the two, but he has I so I just learned this. I was reading uh, I believe it was on the athletic. It might have been, I might have just saw somebody posted on Reddit. Uh, I forget exactly where I saw it, but essentially Ferkser gets a thousand dollars uh every time he pancake blocks somebody on a chip. So <laughs> so you know, take that as but again, this is why I like this Titans team just overall. They are just I, I mean, Bengals' first road playoff game in the Zach Taylor era. Like, I just Zach Taylor like, on the road. So physical. Too, been, They're going to be so physical. Dreadful. It's like uh, the most cliche thing in all of – like, I hate when people say it on, on those pregame shows, but I think it rings so true. Like, the Titans are going to play such a physical game. By the way, versus teams left in the divisional round, AFC or NFC, 
Titans are 4-0, 109 to 67 point differential. So yeah, I, I think I think that Swain will be involved. I think the two tight end sets will be big. And that is why for my third pick and the fifth overall pick in the divisional round six pack, I'm going with Nick Westbrook Aquina under 28 and a half receiving yards. So he's been under this in 10 of 17 games anyway. So uh, he trends under this number. Now, obviously that's a lot of those games have come without AJ Brown and or Julio Jones. So there were games when Westbrook Aquino was the number one receiver that are, that are contributing to that. And he still went over this number in only seven games. Now he has taken over uh, for the most part, that number three role from Chester Rogers. Thank goodness. Cause I don't know how Chester Rogers is, you know, a top three receiver in today's NFL, but uh, regardless of that, it goes back to the point when you have Julio and Brown healthy uh, and you have Derrick Henry, the Titans are going to every early down the, the Titans are going to want to come out in those two tight end sets, especially because the Bengals are much weaker against tight ends uh, than they are against that, you know, non primary receivers. And that's because Mike Hilton, their slot corner is top 20 in, in PFF coverage ranking among over a hundred cornerbacks. So Hilton is very good inside. He's not that big, but still a very good inside corner. And Cincinnati really has two corners playing really well, Wuzie and Hilton. And then you kind of pick on EY Apple. So, you know, Westbrook Aquina can line up inside outside, but he is still going to be, you know, two out of the, you know, three places he can line up. He'll be facing a very good cornerback. And then you just you look at Tennessee, they're a favorite. And, and the books aren't going a three, at least. It hasn't seemed like they are, which is kind of telling too. So this could be just a bad game script, um, you know, for, for a ton of throwing you know, for the, to the third wide receiver, usually those guys go over in games where, you know, the team is trailing, you get a couple of those, you know, two minute drill kind of long completions. The third receiver is not covered because you're focusing on the top two guys. So this just doesn't set up to me as a game where they need Westbrook Aquina uh, still think, you know, they love him uh, good could do every can do a little bit of everything kind of Jack of all trades, master of none kind of player. So I think, could see him make a big player too, maybe even catches a, a red zone touchdown, but uh, I just don't see him being consistently on the field or the need for him to be consistently targeted when you have AJ and Julio, who you can kind of move around, dictate matchups here uh, and get them on Eli Apple. So um, yeah, going under Westbrook Aquina 28 and a half. And I think it correlates pretty well to Swaim over because uh, I'm also betting on Titans just using a ton of two tight end. Now, one, one last question. I, I like that. I'll, I'll, I'll throw some change on it. Um, so I don't really have a position in this game. So I'll have some fun with some props. See if anything pops live, um, which you can follow along in the Action Network app. What did you, for your projections, what are you, and do you have any just random subjective thoughts? What are you projecting for Henry? Like, are you so I have like him 80% workload? Uh, yeah. I usually take about 15% off for a guy like it with like some injury question marks. So um, even with that, I still have him projected for uh, 96 rushing yards and uh, about a, about an 80% chance for a touchdown. So, yeah. And that's with taking, you know, workload off. I mean, I, I think if, cause, so I, I read a stat that when you come back from this kind of injury, if you do it in about four to six weeks, you come back, you're about 75% but you do it in about eight weeks, which is where we're kind of at with Henry. I think a little over eight weeks and you're closer to 93 to 95%. So, you know, kind of split the difference either way. You never know. They might limit his snaps. Foreman's been playing well, uh, but you know, with this O line healthy um, with the receivers healthy to kind of, you know, the, the threat of play action is still there at least, um, even though you, I, you would think they would sell out to stop Henry with this Bengals D line. That's a little less healthy than it was coming into the playoffs. Um, I, I wouldn't be worried about him too much, but the thing is their rushing efficiency really hadn't dropped off with Foreman, which is nuts. It was just more so that their pass game efficiency, the play action that really dropped off. And that's what contributed to, you know, and, and just yeah, the injuries. Not in as worried. Defenses aren't as worried about. Yeah. Foreman. They're not. Uh, yeah. So he's not running into as many loaded boxes, boxes obviously. where Henry is and still having the same success. Yeah. So it's, you know, it, it again, I think, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's a formidable backup for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think he I think he might still see, you know, four or five carries in this game. Um, Hilliard, I mean, maybe you just don't play him uh, even in the past game. And then they cut McNichols and sign him to the practice squad. So who knows if he'll even be elevated because they got Jordan Wilkins to play special teams. Uh, oh, and I didn't even mention, you know, I mean, it doesn't really pertain to Westbrook Aquina, but uh, Tory Carter, their second fullback, because, of course, the Titans have two fullbacks. 
uh, was activated, uh, was designated to return. He may be active as well. Uh, and he's actually a much better blocker than Blossom game. So that just adds another element uh, to their run game, which would mean, I guess, the less they need of Westbrook or Keenan as well, because if you have a fullback on the field, you don't need the third receiver. So, uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of things kind of point to this, these correlations, Swain over, Westbrook, Kina under. Uh, hopefully we uh, we hit these. All right, where are you going for your uh, third and final? Yeah, for my third and final pick of the divisional round weekend six-pack, I'm going with drumroll, the Los Angeles Rams plus three at BetMGM at Tampa Bay. Yes, I'm going with Matthew Stafford against Tom Brady on the road, catching only a field goal. Um, I don't think – I don't show the most amount of value in this line, but I do show some value in the Rams, and I love the matchup based on what Tampa has left on their roster. And I, I like the on-field matchup, which I'll get into. But – you look at some of these offensive line injuries for the Bucs at right ta- all pro right tackle, Pro Bowl center, who are both banged out. I think they're both probably going to give it a go, but they're not going to be 100%. And there's a chance one or both don't go. And you saw once they were hurt and went down, the Eagles were just all over Brady. And that's exactly what the Rams defensive line could do. Top seven in both adjusted sack rate and pressure rate. That is how you have to stop and contain Brady. Aaron Donald and company have to get pressure and they're capable of doing so. It's one of the reasons why the Rams beat the Bucks at home earlier this year in dominant fashion. And I don't see a lot of people talking about this other game last year, the Rams went on the road to Tampa and dominated the Bucks. They had 413 yards held Tampa to 250 came as in late November last year. Bucks averaged 3.7 yards per play. Jared Goff just threw for like 5 billion yards and the, and the uh, Rams averaged 5.8 yards per play. You're going to hear all about the Brady stats against the spread. Of course, his, all of his against the spread stats are great. He's only 17 and 17 against the spread as a favorite though in the playoffs, but he's 53, 31 and four. That's 63% as a dog or favorite of three or less 10 and five in the postseason. He's also 13 and five against the spread at home in Tampa two and oh in the playoffs, but I can, I can go against the spread trends on the other side as well that I think have some warrant here. McVeigh, by the way, 10 and four against the spread 71.4% as a road dog covering by six points per game. Here's an important, important nugget. He's 10 and five against the spread on the East coast covering by seven points per game, 12 and three straight up. That includes that trip to Tampa last year. There's some, there's something that you you see the Rams all the time. So like, this is like, Oh, short week. You got to go out. You have to go out East by Tampa. Like the Rams have consistently, whatever they're doing from a preparation standpoint, travel standpoint, like they're ready for these games, which I think is an important point here. Uh, And for what it's worth, these, these short, you have a short week against a team. uh, You know, these teams on a short week, like five to six days, of prep, you see that with uh, the 49ers against the uh, Packers, like they only have they have a shorter week than normal, and the Packers are off a bye. The Rams obviously have a shorter week against the spread numbers. Are, it, 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 there hasn't been any edge either way. I might just be priced in the market, but thought it was worth noting. But with these offensive line injuries, with the wide receiver injuries for the Bucks, this this Rams defense was built. They, you know, I said the Bills kind of constructed their defense to stop the Chiefs, and they, all they were worried about was the Chiefs. The Rams, all they were worried about is the Bucks, and this is how they kind of constructed their defense. And I think that they are very they're they're built as well as anyone in the NFL to slow down and contain Brady, as they've done in each of the past two meetings. On the other side of the ball. The, the offensive line is great for the Rams. They're not going to be able to run much here. But I think Stafford will have success throwing against a, a vulnerable Tampa secondary. Stafford got did just a huge game last week just for his confidence and momentum. And, you know, Beckham is playing really well. I didn't think he'd be playing this well. The Bucks are going to blitz. That is what they do. They blitz as much as anyone in the league. Stafford is excellent against the blitz. He has receivers that can win one-on-one battles on the outside. I think that's important here. I think McVay will have a very good script early on. 
And I just see the Rams defense matching up well. I think that Stafford can have some success through the air. And I just think that these two teams, you know, as right now, when you take all of the issues with the Bucks roster, I don't, I think the Rams might be the better team right now. And uh, I do respect Brady, but the field goal is obviously so important in a playoff game and especially in a game like this. Uh, I'll gladly take the field goal here. I also tease them up with the Bills over a touchdown. Um, I think the Rams go into Tampa and get the win. And uh, yeah, so I'm siding. I'm siding with McVay and company. I hope he doesn't let me down on some. By the way, these are two very conservative coaches when it comes to like fourth downs. They're like worst in the league. So if you're looking at an under here, so I was looking at the under. I might go first half under, maybe. Bucks have started really slow. Um, these two teams are really fast. They're top five in a trusted pace and situation neutral, uh, situation neutral pace. But like, I think that the Rams are going to have some success. I think that the Bucks are going to start slow, and then like, but you see in the second half, if it's like, all right, if the Rams are start chucking it all over, you can see a staff or mistake that they're behind. You know, Brady playing from behind, he's going to score. So maybe the first half under is the way to go. The only thing that kept me off this total though, is what I think the bucks are going to do, especially if they have offensive line injuries is they're going to go hurry up. And I mean, super hurry up. uh, I think all game. And the reason that I think that is obviously that would help neutralize the Los Angeles pass rush and some of their subs and just keep the defense on its toes. But the, uh, if you look at the no huddle offensive metrics for the Bucks this year, they're absolutely elite. I mean, and the pressure rate, sack rate go down to almost nothing. And if you look at the, if you look at some of what they were hinting at this week, here's just listen to this quote Bruce Arians on the no huddle. He just, when you look back and do the self scout, that's what we've been our best at this year. So why not do it more? So I, I think that if with the offensive line injuries, you're going against Donald, I think Brady's going to come out here and go like super fast. I could see it. So that's, and if that happens, like he's going like no huddle from the start, the entire game, you're the under is cooked. Um, so I'm staying away from the total, but uh, I think the Rams defense has paths to success here to slow down this really beat up bucks offense. And I think Stafford, you know, hopefully he doesn't have a clunker. I think that he, has passed the success here. And uh, yeah, I like, I like the Rams. Yeah. For me, this one is going to rely heavily on what happens with the injuries later in the week, specifically as it pertains to Tristan Wirfs and Ryan Jensen, because Wirfs and Jensen both didn't practice uh, on Wednesday, but that's not surprising. Their swing tackles hurt too. Yeah. I think I, you know, Wirfs, I don't know if he's going to go. I mean, just seeing what, what happened with the injury and, and, you know, coming back in and it, it just couldn't really do anything and went down again. I, I'd be surprised I if he's he goes. Out Jensen's going to try to play. Yeah. That's- so, but this is, you know, that it's, it's obviously big, you know, losing a guy like worse, who is a top, uh, top six tackle in, among 84 tackles in PFF's grades, but Jensen now, cause like, you know, Tom Brady, why are we so hesitant to bet against him? Because, you know, he's essentially the best player in football when you take like clutch into, into account and just, you know, expertise and know-how. I know he's not, you know, he doesn't have the arm talent of like a Mahomes or, or anything like that. But uh, now if you have Jensen, anything less than hundred percent, cause he's 13th among all centers in PFF grades, but he's just 24th of 39 in pass blocking. So he's already kind of average, a little bit below average here in pass blocking. Now you're talking about the best defensive player in football with a big edge on the center, which then affects the best offensive player in football and Brady. Cause we've always known that's how you beat Brady is interior pressure, right? It's like, it's like he could throw the ball so quick that if Wirfs is out, you know, whether they have to chip with Cameron Brait, Rob Gronkowski is a great blocker. If they want to chip with him, I mean, they, they can probably still make it work uh, to a certain extent, especially with time to prepare for it. Um, it it'll be difficult. Obviously Rams have a great, uh, you know, edge rush too. But now if you're talking about Aaron Donald's, against a banged up center uh, or, or anything less than hundred percent, that's going to really mess up what the bucks are trying to do. Uh, 
And so that that I think is going to come down. It could down also to, be a backup guard though. Like to get, if yeah. if if Worfs is out, then you know you're going to have because their their swing tackle is Josh Wells. He's also I think out, and that means you know you're probably going to have Alex Kappa go to right tackle. Then you're going to have Aaron Stinney playing guard, and then uh, a banged up Brian Jensen at center. That's a mess. I guess it, and then you can move Donald around just like, okay, where's the weak spot? Where can we um, exploit this beat up offensive line? But yeah, j- just blowing up the pocket against Brady is how you beat this team and doing it quickly. And that's, that's why you have to do it from the interior. And um, yeah. So I think that this is, yeah, this, it's just like, I think you're, you're I think this is a matchup where they really miss Godwin Um and you could just see last week, like they played the Eagles, right? Like the Eagles who haven't beat anyone all year, their defense improved throughout the year. And you saw their defensive line after the Bucks' offensive line was hurt. Like they, their defensive line started to dominate, but the Eagles secondary is like, all right, let's play everything. Let's play way off everything. And they just don't have a lot of talent across the board. Whereas the Rams, you know, they have a similar philosophy in a lot of ways, but they have much more raw talent uh at corner than the eagles do and uh you just hope that eric weddle doesn't get burnt too much but eric weddle's had some uh successful some success against tom brady i'll be interested to watch that but yeah i just think it's all about the defensive line against this offensive line that's at best going to be playing at way less than 100 percent but I, yeah, based on what Worfs looks like, I don't see how he'd be able to go. I actually see. think Wells could go. Um, he did practice on a limited basis. So that's better than Jensen and Worfs. So maybe he goes, but, you know, and then to play devil's advocate, because I, you know, there, I still do see some concerns with the Rams more on the offensive side of the ball. So yeah, they dominated the Cardinals. Okay, great. They ran the ball 38 times. They caught, they had 19 dropbacks. Uh, so I talked to, I've been talking about Stafford and how he's kind of, declined over this down the stretch, you know, all, all year. And I, you know, were they trying to hide, like, were they, you know, were they, was that the game plan coming in or was it just the game script? Probably a little of both, but in this game, you know, the bucks are top are, are number six in run defense success rate allowed. And their weakness has been these explosive run plays and, and they've lost contain. They, they do love to blitz. So if they blitz through the wrong gap, because they blitz a lot on early downs to the books and, you know, if you blitz through the wrong gap, you know, sometimes guys pop big plays, uh, but that's, you know, that didn't really happen against the Eagles, a team that is good at that. It's good at explosive runs and, and running the ball with volume. And, and I think a lot of it has to do with the bucks being healthier, you know, up front. So I do worry that if you do get into one of these situations where Brady is kind of just dinking and dunking, because that's been the Rams' weakness too on defense has been short passes. If the you know if the if the Bucks are still just you know doing what they have to do on offense, that you are going to get some of those mistakes from Stafford, and that run game is just not going to be there um, the way it was. So I, I do have some concerns with both of these teams on the offensive side of the ball. I think you're onto something with that. Under uh, I do agree that you know if, if you don't want these teams to obviously go hurry up, but. Uh, you know, that that's kind of why I say I think what does it for me is just the health of those Bucks linemen. Like, because oh, the line is dropping to two and a half at a lot of books. And, you know, if the Bucks are going to have their old line completely healthy, I, I think, you know, I think it's a field goal game. I think it's minus three, you're getting two and a half. But if they're not, I think it's more like a minus two and a half. So then if you could get the three, that's obviously very valuable because the Rams could just flat out win the game anyway. So um, that's what it really comes down to, to for me. But um, I, I do see concerns with both offenses here, and I don't think it'll be as high a scoring as a game as it was in that first matchup where, what are they, they combined to throw for like over 800 yards <laughs> in that game. Yeah. I think Gronk got hurt and they still went, the Bucks still went off and, and the Deshaun Jackson, who's not no longer there, quite a big one. So um, yeah, for me, it's just going to come down to, to, to what happens with worse in, in Jensen. Yeah. I think the Bucks, I mean, it's Tom Brady. He's going to have success moving the ball and taking a duck. But I think what's going to happen is, the Rams are going to be okay with that with their advantages on the defensive line, because, you know, make them take 10 to 12 plays to go down. And eventually you're going to have a negative play with your defensive line, right? You're going to get a sack. You might get a forced fumble, um, a stop in the red zone. So um, that'll do it for the six pack. Yeah, let's go. Uh, It's a recap. Stuck is going with the Rams plus three bills, chiefs 
under 54 and a half and Jeff Swaim over 11 and a half receiving yards. I'm going with the Bills plus one and a half, the Titans minus three and a half, and Nick Westbrook Aquina under 28 and a half receiving yards.